Good evening, everybody. The U.S.-China trade talks are underway in Washington with far more at stake than many Americans realize. And those talks will in all likelihood significantly influence the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. For that reason, and the sheer impact on U.S.-China relations, geopolitically as well as economically, there is a coordinated influence operation in full swing in this country. It targets both Congress and the Senate, and most particularly, the president. Much of that influence campaign is being pushed by the Chinese government itself, trying to link the outcome of the trade talks to America's stock market stability and its growth. In other words, it's outright economic fear-mongering and patently pure fiction. In fact, the president's historic call for balanced international trade, reciprocal and mutual fair trade, will benefit the entire global economy. It's a clear battle between the national interest, workers, small business, and the U.S. multinationals and globalists who are investing billions of dollars to preserve the status quo and their financial interests, of course. As expressed in the major media outlets over the last week or two, networks as well, and of course the political orthodoxy of both major parties. The disinformation campaign led by the Chinese government. It has allies on Wall Street, corporate America, some of whom Vice President Pence referred to in his important speech on China last October at the Hudson Institute. Some of those allies are registered foreign agents. Others aren't registered, but just as energetic in trying to overturn the Trump agenda. The radical Dems, the establishment rhinos, globalist elites, Wall Street, the Koch brothers, the Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce, all working now to undercut the Trump administration's position in those trade talks. Tonight, we take up the anti-Trump efforts to thwart the trade negotiations and the president's efforts to secure a fair and reciprocal deal with China, Asia expert Gordon Chang among our guests here tonight. Fired in disgrace, former acting FBI director Andrew McCabe not only confessing his role in the planned coup against President Trump, but his recollection of such efforts which are wildly inconsistent and contradictory. Listen to McCabe try to explain that discussing the 25th Amendment with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein wouldn't be about overthrowing President Trump. The conversation was not about removing the president. Well, that's what the 25th Amendment yeah, is. Yeah, so you know. Rod bring, brought up the 25th Amendment, mentioned it in the course of a wide-ranging and frenetic conversation. It was simply one thing, one topic, um, in the midst of a whole host of issues that we were thinking about and, and kind of working uh, through our heads. Did I think the word coup uh, and the words treason are, are interesting and inflammatory. They get people's attention, but they have nothing to do with the conversations that Rod Rosenstein and I had. If there is justice, it will also be uh, our time for the uh, McCabe uh, infatuation uh, parade to uh, focus on treason, treachery. Uh, I think he might get focused on those words. Uh, those are the confused and contradictory words of the man who was fired by the FBI for lying, who clearly conspired to undermine the U.S. government. I think Andrew McCabe has made a fool out of himself over the last couple of days, and he really looks to me like sort of a poor man's J. Edgar Hoover. He's a, uh, I think he's a disaster. And what he was trying to do was terrible, and he was caught. I'm very proud to say we caught him. The FBI has some of the greatest people, some of the finest people you'll ever meet, but this man is a complete disaster. We take up McCabe's confessions, his contradictions with House Freedom Caucus founder Jim Jordan here tonight, former chief assistant U.S. attorney Andrew McCarthy. And President Trump demands California return the billions of dollars the state took from American taxpayers to fund a failed rail project. The governor of California is having a fit. We take that up and much more with radio talk show host Mark Simone, Trump 2020 surrogate Gina Loudon join us. Our top story, President Trump's trade negotiations with China under attack by actors who would like the United States to forego reciprocal and fair trade with China and instead keep the United States subject to theft and trade deficits with China in perpetuity. Among them, the Chamber of Commerce clamoring for a deal 
despite its role as a major enabler of China's force technology transfers and its theft of hundreds of billions of dollars of intellectual property and technology each and every year. The chamber's fear-mongering exemplified by Myron Brilliant, who told CNBC this, quote, the markets are nervous. The markets will not respond if there isn't a good deal. Uh, that would be, of course, a good deal on the chamber's terms. For more on the latest in the U.S. trying to trade talks, we turn to Ed Lawrence in Washington with the latest. Ed? Well, Lou, intense talks today at the deputy level. Those levels ended today, and now the shift is to the primary level talks. Tomorrow, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer will lead the U.S. team face to face with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He. The Vice Premier received another title for these talks. He's also Chairman Xi Jinping's special envoy. Now, that's meant to be a signal that the Vice Premier speaks for all of China, and any agreement he makes will be followed by President Xi. The Chinese want to get to President Donald Trump to move that. That March 1st tariff deadline uh, where he increases tariffs. Now, the president has signaled that he might take that step if we are close to a deal. One big sticking point, the Chinese balking at the pace of structural changes that the U.S. wants. Also, the mechanism of, his, of enforcement if tariffs are paused or set up to snap back. Now, some policy experts say that the Chinese might also be testing the president's resolve to see if he will back off on tariffs without a deal. I think it's going to come in May or June or sometime in, in that time frame. And I think since the president likes the drama of who's up, who's down, I think between now and May and June, there'll be a few days where it's not going to look too good. And in Beijing, government officials told a group of U.S. business leaders that China would open its doors wider to the world, but the U.S. needs to respect China's right to develop and become prosperous. We may get more insight into the talks later next week. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer accepted an invitation to testify before the House Ways and Means Committee about U.S.-China trade issues. That's Wednesday, right before the trade tariff deadline. Lou? Ed, thank you very much. Ed Lawrence from Washington joining us tonight, columnist, author, Asia expert, Gordon Chang. Gordon, good to have you here. I, I love the Chinese uh, state media talking about China's right to prosper. The United, States must, the United States must respect China's right to prosper. When you, What you really hear them saying is China expects us to respect their right to steal hundreds of billions of dollars from us every single year. Oh, absolutely. And they also demand that we accept their WTO, World Trade Organization violations. All of those bilateral deals that they made with the U.S., they are allowed to violate those, and we're not supposed to say anything. This is a coordinated campaign, Lou. We saw it in the Global Times, which is Communist Party media. We saw it in foreign ministry statements. They're saying exactly the same thing. You can't talk about structural issues, they say. Well, if you can't talk about structural issues, there's no point in talking to the Chinese in the first place. There is a fundamental fundamental, uh, to me, illusion here that is abroad in uh, the U.S. media uh, in all forms, business outlet, news outlets, uh, the general press, the political press. If there is no uh, metric by which you can judge whether or not China is complying with an agreement, you don't have an agreement. Uh, what is the deficit reduction? What is the impact? Uh, how, how are we going to defend our intellectual property and uh, our technology uh, against Chinese theft? Uh, we can't simply take their assurance that they won't steal from us because that's preposterous. They're right now uh, carrying out cyber attacks against the United States government, against corporate America, and having their way uh, with the United States as if these talks weren't taking place and as if they were in, in no way uh, going to uh, you know, be in any way uh, a, an aggrieved party as a result of the actions of the Chinese. We yeah. are aggrieved. We're under assault, for God's sake. No, we certainly are. You know, we're having these discussions with the Chinese, and no one is looking back at that September 2015 agreement where you had Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, standing next to President Obama in the Rose Garden, and the Chinese say, we are not going to cyber attack American corporates for commercial purposes. Well, they've continued to do that. And we saw from that CrowdStrike report that their attacks are gaining all the time, especially in 2018. So the question is, how can you deal with this? The only enforcement mechanism is that you make it so difficult for the Chinese to import into the U.S. You raise the tariffs, you have import bans, you do all of that. If the and president, that's the only thing you can do. If the president, if the president for whatever his reasons, 
backs off on those March 1st tariffs going up, uh, uh, it, it will be, I would think, the end of whatever leverage the president has in these talks. Uh, the Chinese are acting as if uh, there's no one seated at those tables. Uh, Mnuchin is sitting there. Larry Kudlow is sitting there. You know, he, the Chinese may be half right. Those are two of the most accommodating, appeasing uh, individuals that could be at a table with a Chinese right now. It is, to me, it's inexplicable. Yeah. You know, the president should not say, I'm going to maybe sort of let the tariffs slide, because that's the reason why the Chinese are there in the first place. It's because of the tariffs. They're they're really concerned about them going up from 10 to 25 percent. As a matter of fact, Lou, I would actually say it's got to be more than 25 percent to get the Chinese to even sort of talk to us in good faith, which is really, really difficult. Clearly, they... if the president does not maintain those tariffs uh, in any way, talks about a snapback, uh, which you know, they never I mean, snap back. A... I, that's a terrific position for the Chinese to take, which is another way of saying remove the tariffs. Uh, it, there will be nothing to snap back if the if the administration uh, is successful in these negotiations. And if they're not successful, uh, woe is America, because this president is the only person, the only world leader to have the guts to say to the Chinese, this will not stand. And there will be mutual Balance, reciprocal trade, and your mercantilist, imperialistic nonsense ends now, Xi Jinping. Uh, it's that simple, because otherwise uh, the West is doomed. And, and watch Europe as it falls in line. I mean, listen to what we're doing. We're listening to Angela Merkel, it, these idiots talking about in Washington collusion with the Russians. Angela Merkel is insisting on keeping her uh, gas contracts uh, with the Russians. She's embracing Vladimir Putin, uh, even as he threatens to extinguish her uh, her country. I mean, it's it's madness what is going on in the world, and we have one man standing up. And that is Donald Trump, and he is a, the forces of the establishment are arrayed against him. Whether it is the business press, whether it is the political press, whether it is the establishment, corporate America, the business, I mean, the list goes on. Every dollar that's being spent to turn back this president because he's anti establishment and will not accept the orthodoxy that means to destroy the American destiny. You know, we have seen so many trade negotiations between previous presidents and the Chinese, and they have all failed. And the Chinese have violated every single agreement. So this is really important for us. And you're absolutely right. This is where it, we either stand or we fail. And it's the only thing that's going to get us there is President Trump. And it's that straightforward. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Thanks, Lou. Keep the faith. Right on. Up next, Andrew McCabe. Well, he's... Uh, uh, changing his tune about lots of things. He's changing his words. He's changing uh, everything, the composition, the context, all about the 25th Amendment and Rod Rosenstein. Maybe he didn't really mean that, says he. Rosenstein was actually openly talking about whether there was a majority of the cabinet who would vote to remove the president. That's correct. Counting votes. Did he that present time. that idea to other cabinet officials because, as you know, he had yeah. to count heads to see, do I have the votes to remove the president? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Not that he's aware of. Yes, he did. Uh, yes, he didn't. We take up the uh, McCabe contradictions, his inconsistencies, right after this quick break. Former Chief U.S. Assistant Attorney, Federal Prosecutor Andy McCarthy joins us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Business Network. Former Director of National Intelligence, anti-Trump, James Clapper, today saying he believes the findings in Mueller's final special counsel report could be, as he put it, anticlimactic. I think the, the, the hope is that the Mueller investigation will clear the air on this issue once and for all. I'm really not sure it will, and, and the investigation, when completed, could turn out to be quite anticlimactic and not draw a conclusion about that. Again, I don't know. 
he has known for a very long time, but it hasn't stopped him from being an anti-Trumper. Let's not forget about Clapper, Comey, and Brennan, the three stooges, the three crooks who led the Justice Department, who led the National Security Intelligence Apparatus, and conspired to overthrow President Trump. All three lied under oath. Comey was fired. President Trump revoked each of their security clearances, and people were wondering why can't this president like these three gentlemen early on? You remember those days? Joining us tonight, Andrew McCarthy. Andy is the former chief assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, worked in the office for 18 years, now a National Review contributing editor, Fox Business contributor, and always a great American. Andy, good to have you with us. Anti Lou, great to be with you. Anticlimatic, says Clapper. Uh, those three bums who ran the intelligence apparatus under President Obama, uh, for him to make such a suggestion with all that he's insinuated, said directly and specifically against this president uh, and his administration, I, I have to tell you, my blood boils when I think about it. Well, I think, Lou, that this has always been fundamentally an impeachment investigation. Oh, no doubt. And, you know, well, so they have to get the they have to get done and get the report to the House. Uh, it's obvious that it's been winding down. I think I read something this afternoon that uh, Mueller's very large staff is down to 12 lawyers, and some of them are contacting their old employers about going back to work. So this thing has been downsizing and, and kind of down to the short strokes for a while now. Yeah, I, I personally think, I, I know that that's your theory. My theory is that it was in place of an impeachment, which they couldn't possibly carry out. And controlling the House doesn't mean much uh, when you basically have Adam Schiff as the chief provocateur. Uh, he's an impotent and ineffective uh, congressman. God knows he wouldn't be able to lead such a, uh, uh, an effort successfully. I, 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 I frankly think that they are fools who now realize their hour is over and the remainder of the days, and I'm talking about six years of days, remain with this president. What do you think? Well, I think we have to be clear on what we're talking about with respect to impeachment. I still think the president will be... I think there's probably three chances out of four that he will be impeached in the sense that the Democratic-controlled House of Representatives will file articles of impeachment. Oh, those are well, ever that's be a, wait a minute. Now, if you're talking about impeachment from, uh, you know, uh, from Green, from Schiff, uh, the usual suspects, Nadler, right. I mean, these are left-wing uh, bozos, for crying out loud. Uh, one couldn't control them no matter what the facts. The facts are that there is nothing uh, to bring impeachment uh, proceedings for other than the offended uh, right, but, uh, hearts of these left-wing yeah. radicals. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be clear that I wasn't suggesting I thought the president was going to yeah. be removed, but I think that we there's a high that likelihood. clarity of these days. <laughs> well, but I just think that Mueller needs to get the report done because yeah. if there's going to be an impeachment in the House, he's got to get it to them. Yeah, well, I, there's nothing that says that he has to get it to them, uh, only that he has to get it to the attorney general, as you well know. Uh, That's the true. attorney general right. certainly would not, uh, I, I would hope, would not be eager to share that report with a bunch of, uh, as I said earlier, uh, left-wing bozos. Uh, who think that this, these minutes uh, uh, that they hold are going to turn into hours and days. I don't believe so. Uh, let, let's turn to Clapper on CNN saying it's going to be anticlimactic. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the folks in the intelligence uh, community, along with Brennan, along with Comey, then uh, following on now with the DNI, uh, Dan Coates, uh, and the others. I mean, what is going on with this intelligence community that they have the effrontery? to talk as they do uh, to this president in this disrespectful manner and publicly contradict the, the president's policy choices? Well, you know, look, I, I think, Lou, that when these guys were running, uh, particularly Clapper and Brenner, when they were, Brennan, when they were running the intelligence community, yeah. the intelligence community famously had politicized intelligence product, they're now out of the intelligence community and they sound more like 
partisan operatives than, yes. than former intelligence guys. And they're clearly politically opposed to the president. So I think they're now doing from the outside what they were, you know, largely doing from the inside before this. And, and it would be nice if the national left-wing media had the integrity to acknowledge that the president was right about those three gentlemen uh, and, uh, and has been vindicated by the partisanship they've uh, demonstrated and tried to wield against him uh, as president. Uh, let's, I, I want to turn to, to the idea that this, this president, no matter uh, what, has been innocent throughout. But now he has a, a known uh, corrupt uh, leadership at the Department of Justice, at the FBI. And I don't know if that can be, uh, th those agencies, that department can be, uh, well, can it ever uh, have its integrity uh, restored uh, and the public's trust restored because it's taking a severe beating uh, over the course of this, uh, these, uh, these attacks over three years against this president. Yeah, well, you and I have talked about this before, Lou, and I'm not as... Uh pessimistic about that as you are. I think mm -hmm. what has to happen is there has to be accountability. There's got to be a credible investigation, soup to nuts, of what went on here. And I think Attorney General Barr is, is, uh, is committed to making sure that that happens. So uh, I expect that they'll ha take a long look at this. Mm -hmm. And if, if we don't need a long credible look. accountability... We've had enough long looks, Andy. i got to interrupt you. I'm tired of the Justice Department and the FBI. It's a place where truth goes to die, where if you want to hide the truth, you start an FBI investigation. You don't hear about Benghazi. You don't hear what's happened to all of these people who we know committed crimes, who were guilty of outright Lou, political at any, corruption. Lou, at any, at any moment, the president could unseal all this stuff and, and put it out publicly. Well, He's chosen that not time, to do in that. my judgment, Andy, has arrived. It's, arrived uh, some time ago, as a matter of fact. But the idea well, of another well, lengthy he, investigation... Lou, I, hear, I hear he takes your calls. Well, he, <laughs> I, I don't know that he does uh, take my calls, uh, you know, that often. How? What would you say would be a regular kind of a, occurrence? I'd say, I'd say uh, even if you could do it once, put a bug in his ear. We need some disclosure. I, you know what? I will uh, give it my very best effort to get through that White House switchboard. I'm going to try just for you, Andy McCarthy, and the nation. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Lou. Great to see you. Andy Thank McCarthy. You. Up next, Elizabeth Warren plans to push through her radical ideas with national emergencies of her own. Uh, she doesn't seem to have much faith in uh, her colleagues in the U.S. Senate. Now, why is that? Gina Loud and Mark Simone join us here next. Stay with us. Before we go, oh, yes, we get to look at the national debt, $22 trillion and climbing. We're coming right back. Stay with I hate that number, don't you? We'll be right back. I switched to lip Insight into 2020 surprising issue on Varney tomorrow. Twenty twenty candidate Elizabeth Warren has a ring to it, doesn't it? Warren saying she would declare three national emergencies if the good if the good nation would just elect her president. The senator telling a late night host those emergencies would include, are you ready? Climate change, gun violence, and student loan debt. Under President Obama's watch, by the way, total student loan debt more than doubled, reaching $1.4 trillion in 2016. I think that President Obama looked at student loan debt as just another uh, federal government subsidy of left-wing indoctrinating professors and institutions across the country. Well, joining us tonight, WOR radio talk show host, personality and star outright, Mark Simone and Gina Loudon, political analyst, author, best-selling author, member of President Trump's media advisory board. And I think that's got to be one of the toughest jobs anybody's got, advising this president on media. That, that's got to be a wonderful meeting. He doesn't need any advice, Lou. It's more about advising the media how to understand what he's actually saying rather than twist it. That's, a, that, that's an almost an equally uh, tough job, I would think. I knew what it was. I was just kidding. Uh, let me turn to, first of all, the, the, the trade talks that are going on right now. Uh, the, the, the country is absolutely awash in money and optimism. 
uh, we, we have a president who is turning this country in the right direction, and we still have a left-wing national media that cannot give this man credit for a single thing. Imagine the historic success this president uh, ha has, uh, has engineered, uh, and no one wants to credit him. No one, it seems, in the national media. You know, I remember, Lou, at the beginning of his presidency at that one year. Year mark, we were counting one major accomplishment every 36 hours. More promises made and kept by this president in a checklist form, which I understand he actually has that checklist. Um, and 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 yet there is no credit given. But you know, the American people are going to forever hold politicians to the Donald Trump standard of promises made, promises kept. And also the American people are going to remember the prosperity and, and the safety and the things that this president has concerned concerned himself with. That, it, that, that other presidents in the past haven't, future presidents will be expected to. I love the fact that the president applauded the uh, Covington uh, High School, uh, Nicholas Sandman, the student uh, who famously had the uh, confrontation uh, as, a, uh, uh, as the Native American demonstrator, really confronted him, accosted him, really. Uh, $250 million he's suing the Washington Post for. Uh, I thought th that's a pretty good round number. What do you think? It's a little low, if you ask me, because they also got 50 other media outlets to go after. And uh, these kids will all be driving Lamborghinis by the fall. They're going to do very well. You know, as soon as that story broke, I always, there's one rule. Whenever they say the villain had a MAGA hat, it's never true. Jesse Smollett, there's a lot of examples. As soon as that happened, I went to YouTube, and I found the whole 20-minute video, and I saw just the opposite was the case. Now, I don't know if they have Internet access at the Washington Post, but if I found it on YouTube, yeah. why didn't they? Yeah. That's and, a great and, point. And Smollett, it turns out, now is a suspect rather than uh, the victim that he claimed to be. Uh, Senator Warren, uh, wanting to, I, I mean, it's, what do we got? We've got nine declared candidates for president uh, on the Democratic side. Uh, think about it. President Trump ran against, I think it was against 16 others. They need a few more just to make it interesting, don't you think? <laughs> Not exactly, but I think it's fascinating how uh, some of them are already flipping positions. Uh, we saw Beto O'Rourke already saying, well, maybe there's a time where a fence might be some sort of border, could be. Yeah, we're going to expect... to take the border down in uh, El Paso, for crying out loud. Right, exactly. Good old Beto. But expect more of that flip-flopping flip and jockeying, Lou, to try to gain prominence in, in this race. And, and, and the hypocrisy is what the American people are going to see. You know, it's democratic field, and it's like the buffet. It Mar-a-Lago. You want women? Here's six of them. You want a socialist? We got five of them. You want an old person? We got nine of those. <laughs> what just that's, happened? <laughs> that's on the menu? It's a Democratic ticket. You want a guy with no jacket? We got Beto O'Rourke. It's like a buffet of anything you want. <laughs> Okay. Mark Simone, thank you very much. Gina Lowden, thank you very much. Great and you guys worked out the uh, menu for next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Up next, President Trump demanding millions of dollars be uh, returned from California. The governor doesn't like that. He says American taxpayer money, you know, just goes nowhere, like their rail system. We'll take that up. Plus, uh, we'll have much more on the deep state's efforts to subvert this president. Congressman Jim Jordan joins us here next. Stay with us. Would you like it anyway? Headlines tonight, the Trump administration pulling nearly $1 billion of federal funds back from California's high-speed rail debacle. The Trump administration also, quote, exploring all available legal options to get back $2.5 billion of federal funds that have already been given to the state for the uh, uh, now ended fast rail uh, between San Francisco and L.A. Unbelievable. And, and the governor says that's uh, that, that federal taxpayer money is California's money, his money. Chicago police announcing actor Jesse Smollett is officially now a suspect in a criminal investigation accusing him of filing a false report. Chicago police released the statement that said in part, quote, Detectives are currently presenting evidence before a Cook County grand jury. Well, joining us tonight, Congressman Jim Jordan, ranking member of the House Oversight Committee, member of the Judiciary Committee, co-founder of the House Freedom Caucus. Congressman, good to see you. Uh, you too. McCabe.
contradicting himself already on his uh, confession tour, uh, book tour as well, conveniently for him. Uh, why isn't the man in jail? Yeah, look, we, we've talked about this before. You can't trust anything Andy McCabe says. Uh, turn over his report to the attorney general. Your thoughts? Well, we'll see. I mean, look, we've been hearing this for a while around town. Right. We'll see if it happens next week. I do know one thing that was just announced that is going to happen next week, and that is Michael Cohen is coming in to testify in front of the Oversight Committee. The Democrats just announced it. Right. Their first announced witness of this Congress, their first big hearing, they're bringing a guy to testify in front of Congress who in two months is going to prison for lying to Congress. So th th this just underscores this just underscores the, the, the fundamental point here. Instead yeah. of bringing in Michael Cohen, who's going to come in and tell all kinds of crazy things about the president that we know aren't true because he can't be trusted either, we should have Rod Rosenstein and Andy McCabe under oath in front of the Oversight Committee so we can ask him the questions that the American people want answers to. The most important <laughs> one being, Lou, who was in the room when Rod Rosenstein talked about wearing a wire and, and, and invoking the 25th Amendment? Who all did he communicate that with? We want to know that. And uh, a, a reasonable question of which uh, I guess you're going to have to depend on the testimony of two liars. Uh, it's quite a, as you suggest, a circus that the Democratic uh, uh, Committee chairman are putting together. Uh, let, let's turn to, speaking of Democratic Committee chairman, Adam Schiff, who doesn't seem any longer to have any confidence in Robert Mueller. Suddenly he's talking about going off in his own uh, investigations uh, of Russian collusion. What is, yeah. what is going on here? I will tell you this, Lou. My main concern with Chairman Schiff right now is the fact that two years ago he called for Devin Nunes to step down and step aside for a while as chairman. Right. And now we just learned a few weeks ago that Adam Schiff was meeting with Glenn Simpson in Colorado. And I don't hear, I don't, I, I don't hear anything from Democrats or, per, more importantly, from the Speaker of the House calling for him to step down. That seems a little hypocritical to me. And understand what took place here, Lou. Adam Schiff last summer met with Glenn Simpson in Colorado. Glenn Simpson, the very guy who was paid by the Clintons to put together the dossier. And here's another important point about that. At the time we discovered that the Clintons were paying uh, Glenn Simpson to put together this dirty dossier, Adam Schiff tried to block Congress from getting that information. Because remember, Devin Nunes was threatening to subpoena right. Fusion Bank records, and Adam Schiff was trying to block that. But it was that movement by, and that action by Devin uh, Nunes, then Chairman Nunes, which ultimately gave us those bank records and gave us the fact that the, the Clintons were, in fact, paying Fusion GPS to go put this dossier together. That, mm -hmm. is, that is serious stuff. And so uh, that's my main concern right now with, uh, with Chairman Schiff. And that dossier, of course, the foundation of all that transpired uh, since uh, Schiff playing a, a, a significant role in it all. Do you think he should recuse himself? Well, is that adequate? That's a yeah, that's a decision by the by the Speaker of the House and the and the uh, the Intelligence Committee. But understand this: you had the Clintons pay the law firm Perkins Coie, who hired Glenn Simpson, who went and hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who then put this dossier together. And the idea that the Chairman of the Intelligence Committee is meeting with the very guy hiring yeah. a foreigner to put the dossier together, which is, as you said, was the basis for going to get the FISA warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. That is serious, and so I think it's a pretty important question for the Speaker of the House to raise with, uh, with Chairman Schiff. Absolutely. Congressman, always good to talk with you. Appreciate it. You bet. Congressman Thanks, Jim Jordan. Up next, President Trump, it appears, has finished schooling the Federal Reserve on monetary policy, at least to this point. He may have to do some advanced tutorials for the, <laughs> for the uh, Fed chairman once more. We take that up. And more with former Dallas Fed advisor Danielle DiMartino Booth. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Walking a dog can add th or visit trysuperbeats.com. On Wall Street today, stocks moving higher. The Dow up 63 points, the S&P up 5, the Nasdaq up 2. Not a lot of movement, but it was movement to the upside. 3.8 billion shares. Trading's backed off here.